Welcome once again to our AJ Lunchtime Live. I'm Kimberly Carroll and I am the director of the Animal Justice Academy. Uh, today's topic is the impacts of a plant-based diet on cancer and other chronic diseases with Dr. Zara Kassam. And I want to welcome not only Zara here, but all you lovely beings with us live. And welcome to those of you who are watching the replay. Zara, so happy to have you here, my lovely one. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so in awe of all that you do, your team does, and all of the AJA. As I'm very inspired by all the work that they do that I see on their Facebook page coming up every day. So thank you so much. Oh, and Sara, you are also like, you are quite active in the Animal Justice Academy community too, which we love, you know, I love that all, all of these leaders of uh, these different organizations and initiatives come together in Animal Justice Academy. So I really, you know, I appreciate we have somebody here who knows AJA and, and, and has been part of the crew and, and it's wonderful to have you here. So Zara, let me give you the official, like, I want to give people a little bit of background on you before we dive in. All right. Um, so Zara is a radiation on Oncologist at the Stronach uh, Regional Cancer Center in Newmarket, Ontario. She's also an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Zara is also certified in lifestyle medicine through the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine and co-chairs the Canadian Lifestyle Medicine Advocacy Group. In 2019, Zara co-founded the nonprofit Plant-Based Canada with her friend, registered dietitian Michelle Fideli, uh, to promote plant-based nutrition for individual and planetary health. Zara is the co-author of Eating Plant-Based, Scientific Answers to Your Nutri Nutrition Questions, and that came out in 2022, and it was co-authored with her sister, Dr. Shireen Kassam, and co-editor of the academic textbook, Plant-Based Nutrition in Clinical Practice, also in 2022. Men, we're busy. <laughs> with Shireen and, and Lisa Simon. Um, so Zara, you, you got credentials coming up the, out the wazoo. And, and I, you know, I have to just like say the obvious right now. And that is, um, you are part of a, a powerful trio of Kassam sisters, <laughs> um, who are also here today. Um, first of all, Layla is in the crew. Um, Layla can give a little wave there. Um, Layla was on AJ, uh, oh gosh, I can't, maybe, I don't think maybe a year ago um, for her work in the uh, with Animal Think Tank in the UK. And we loved that AJ, um, Layla. It was so wonderful. And then Shireen, you heard, has co-written two books with Zara about plant-based nutrition. Um, Shireen, I guess you're going to be up next in a year. Can we make a date for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what was in the water in the Kassam household uh, growing up, Zara? Well, my parents are both here today. And oh, they're here too. They're here too. And um, so I see, I see how that works. <laughs> yeah, that just shows you, you know, that my parents are incredible. Our parents are incredible. They're in supportive. They lead by example. They show that, you know, life of, of purpose and service is, is the way to be. And I could say anything, any outlandish thing and say, I want to do this. And they'd say, brilliant great go you'll be great at it so super supportive and um my two sisters again constant inspiration to me and um we've all all become vegan at the same time my parents are vegan uh, as well so we're just it's wonderful to walk this journey all, all of us together oh can you adopt me <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not that I don't love my own family, but the, you just, it's such an awesome family. I want to be a part Thank of it, you. please. <laughs> uh, okay, so Zara, you're a radiation oncologist. Um, I want to find out, first of all, what led you into a profession like this? I mean, it's probably not something you dreamt about being as a little girl. Um, so tell us about what, what the journey there and, and also just what does being a radiation oncologist entail? So I actually, I did not want to be a doctor. I decided I wanted to do mathematics at university. My mother is a mathematics and st statistics teacher. And I guess I wanted to be just like her. So I applied to university to do mathematics. And then uh, one day, it seems really strange. I actually dreamt that I was a doctor and that I woke up the following morning, 100% certain that that's what I wanted to do. Annoyed all my teachers because I put in all the applications. My parents, of course, hugely supportive and so that's it, it was a very strange way to get into it but I never regretted it I've enjoyed every single moment of it and um, you know I've been qualified as a physician for a long time I qualified in 1995 um, 
at that time I decided I wanted to do infectious diseases. Oncology was not on my radar. Um, my father travels uh, for his work and um, I thought, well, I'd love to be like him. I'd love to travel. I've dread the virus hunters and the coming plague. And I wanted to be the person that was called on to go and investigate outbreaks of infectious disease. And I, I love that subject and I did a lot of training in that. and. Um, did extra credentialing through the um, Institute of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene in London. And then uh, when I came to do my specialty training, there were no jobs. So I thought, well, what shall I do while I wait for the ideal job to come up? And my friend had said to me, I think you should try oncology. And I thought, why on earth would I want to do oncology? I mean, how, how depressing that would be. And it, as it happened, a, a great job came up. In a, in a wonderful center. And I thought, well, I'll just do it because I'm just, I'm waiting. There's nothing else, I'll go go for that. And literally within a few days, I thought, no, oh gosh, this, this is for me, this is my place. So, you know, serendipity, luck, destiny, I don't know, but um, I ended up, I think on the path that I wanted to be. And I love my job. I love um, the blessing that I have to um, help people on their journey. Um, it's it's an amazing specialty to be in. I, it's a very multidisciplinary team. Um, you can't be an oncologist just by yourself. You have medical oncologists and surgical oncologists and palliative care physicians. You have nurses and therapists in radiation and physicists. It's a very much a team uh, way of working. And I love that piece as well. So um, it was a bit of a windy route, but uh, this is where I've ended up. Imagine a better person to deal with at, at such a incredibly difficult uh, juncture in one's life. So I'm sure you're just like a guardian angel. Um, and and so uh, you work with patients directly, I guess, but you also do research as well. Yes, I love uh, that part of it because research, quality improvement, it's all part of developing of of delivering best quality care and advancing our profession and the work that we do. So to me, that's all, all part of it. And having uh, my academic appointment helps me do the things that I find meaning in. So for example, I, I have been involved in a mentorship program for the last seven years with the University of Toronto, uh, MD Anderson and the cancer organization in Africa. So we mentor um, radiation oncology trainees from many centers in Africa we teach them about research, we um, mentor the, them through research projects. So this has great meaning to me that I can contribute to capacity building. So that's that's mm -hmm. one example. You know, I'm an examiner for the uh, Royal College for the Radiation Oncology Specialty Exams. Again, this helps me feel part of it all and, and feel that I can, you know, take things in directions that are important to me. So the academic part of it's very important. Uh, as is the clinical side of it. So I, I find joy and meaning in both parts. Same. So Zara, cancer already strikes fear into most of us. Um, but from what I've been seeing and reading and, and even just getting some stats from you, it's sounding like the threat of cancer is becoming even scarier if possible. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So interestingly, the incidence of cancer has actually gone down over the mm. last few years and the mortality or dying from cancer has also gone down. But yet one in two Canadians will have a diagnosis of cancer in their lifetime. Mm. One in four people will die of cancer. Just over 30% of all deaths in Canada are due to uh, cancer. So it has now actually become the leading cause of death in Canada having overtaken heart disease, which is globally the leading cause of death. But the more worrying thing is that when you look at the incidence in, in a more granular fashion, according to disease sites, you find that there are 13 different types of cancers that are increasing in the under 50 year old age group. So we've seen a difference in the pattern and that's happened you know, over the last, um, couple of decades in a time period that is too short to be genetic. It has to be our lifestyle and environmental factors. So th this is worrying. And these are our common types of cancers, colorectal cancer. We've, we've probably all heard of that with, you know, um, 
uh, in the news and uh, but it's it's other cancers like prostate cancer, esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer, other GI cancers, head and neck cancers, endometrial cancers. So the, there's a wide wide range of that happening, and and that that's really scary. Mm. Um, and and what about a, I mean I know the cancer is your specialty, but um, are there any other chronic diseases that uh, are are on the increase um, like cancer is, especially in in younger people? Absolutely. Um, the common ones we can think of are diabetes and obesity. Mm -hmm. So diabetes incidence is going up. The mortality from diabetes is going up as well, um, in part driven by our, our statistics in, in our overweight um, and obesity uh, areas. So, for example, over 60% of Canadians, when we looked at the 2020 data, uh, over 60% of Canadians were either overweight or obese. When we look at our 12 to 17 year olds, 28% or 23% of, of them are overweight or obese. And this is, this is contributing to driving uh, our chronic diseases and we're seeing more diabetes in our younger children. Um, so that's so, so worrying. Um, if we look at the prevalence of heart disease, I mean, that's still very high, although mortality from uh, heart disease and incidence of heart disease has gone down. But then we look at our neurodegenerative diseases, dementia, Parkinson's disease, the prevalence of that, you know, if we look just at, at numbers and dementia um, from 2020 to 2030, we're going to double the number of people with dementia, in part driven by our aging population. So we really are in an epidemic of chronic disease. Um, but these are a lot of these are preventable by what we eat and other lifestyle measures. It's not all about what we eat. That's a, that's a big part. Um, but a lot of these are, are preventable. We can prevent, you know, if we just concentrate on diet, we can say that we can reduce the incidence of cancer by 15 percent, reduce the incidence of heart disease by 25 percent, the incidence of diabetes by 50 percent, high blood pressure by 60 percent. Um, you know, we, we can go on and on. Uh, just, just two days ago, there was a, a study that came out in Parkinson's disease. The people who ate more, more plant-based uh, diets could reduce their risk of Parkinson's disease by 10%. And then if you add in other lifestyle factors, you're going to see even higher, um, higher benefits for you. Mm, amazing. Um, just, you know, while we're talking about other lifestyle um, things, um, you are a lifestyle physician. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and, and what some of those other, we're obviously going to di deep dive into the food element, but just really quickly what some of those other elements are. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that you asked that question. So, you know, lifestyle medicine actually is a, is a well-defined medical specialty. It's one of the fastest growing globally. Um, if you look at the literature, and it looks at the use of evidence-based interventions of lifestyle behaviors to prevent, manage, and in some cases, reverse chronic disease. And we talk about the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. Probably the most important is food, so the whole food plant-based diet. And then we're looking at physical activity. We're looking at good sleep. We're looking at avoiding toxic substances like smoking and alcohol. We're looking at social connection and stress management. So these are the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. And um, we, we have lots of good evidence in each of these areas of how we can benefit our own health. We can live longer, we can live uh, healthier and uh, with more vitality. Mm. So, okay. So the percentages that you just wonderfully rhymed off, uh, the 15% less chance of cancer, 25% less chance of uh, heart disease, I believe, and so on is that, and you said, um, can be, uh, helped with diet. Now, is there a particular diet? Like uh, when you say that, is that like uh, on a whole food plant-based diet that you're talking about? Absolutely. So over the last few decades, there's been such a burgeoning of, of research in nutrition, and it's really hard to keep up with the um, studies that come out showing the benefits of plant-based nutrition. And in fact, I'll just give a shout out to my sister, Shireen, because a few years ago, she started doing weekly reviews of plant-based nutrition literature, and you can sign up to receive those. Those are so incredibly uh, educational. Now she's gone to monthly, um, but that just, just shows you that every week, there thing, there's um, 
studies coming out showing the benefit. And now the clinical guidelines, the country-based guidelines are catching up with that data. So we're seeing you know, the American Heart Association guidelines um, promote plant-based uh, nutrition for reducing the incidence of heart disease, our Canadian diabetes guidelines, our Canada food guide is like the best in the world promoting plant-based diets. If you look at their food plate, it's 87.5% at least from plants. Um, if you look at, you know, the World Health Organization, they're promoting plant-based diets. If you look at the Eat Lancet report, which is um, an amazing document came out in 2019, which looked to see what is the healthiest diet that we can, that can also be uh, we can also keep within our planetary boundaries um, and that is that said you don't need animal products if you want to have animal products maximum of 30 13 percent of your energy requirements from animal products but that's a plant-based diet and that they say you can prevent 11 million deaths a year if you follow this plant-based diet if we look at the global burden of disease study which came out um a couple of years back uh, looked at it, it showed that the, the biggest risk factor for dying um, was what we ate. It, that uh, contributes more than tobacco smoking. So if we had a better diet, we could prevent one in five um, deaths. And when they looked at what these, you know, what these dietary factors were, the top factors were having too much salt in our diet, which is a reflection of the, all the processed foods that we're eating, not having enough fruits, not having enough vegetables, not having enough whole grains, not having enough nuts and seeds. So we are we are not doing very well. If you look at how many people in the community actually follow these guidelines, it's only about five to ten percent of people actually meet the guidelines of what we should be eating. Uh, an incredible study just came out yesterday. It was looking at three hundred health professionals in two medical centers. Dr. Kim Williams did that. He's um, an amazing cardiologist in the U.S. who says that there are two types of cardiologists, those who are vegan and those who haven't read the literature. Uh, and he did this study <laughs> and he found that only 11% of these health professionals were meeting the guidelines for preventing heart disease. So <laughs> none of us are doing very well. Wow. Amazing. That's, yeah, it's so sad. It's, you know, with something so preventable and so easy to do and so helpful in other ways, like the animals and the environment, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but um, so what kind of like with all of these studies, um, Zara, there's, do you still feel like there's just a lot of um, uh, ignorance around this, like both publicly and within the healthcare system? Uh, definitely. Um it's changing. I mean, definitely since when we became vegan 10 years ago, as we all know, you know, we can, we can find more easily find our vegan products compared to what, what it was like 10 years ago. But similarly in the medical profession, there is, um, there is some more awareness than 10 years ago, but it's still very, um, very small. It's certainly not fast enough, not as fast as we need to be doing it. Uh, in Canada, we have um, about 170 Canadian healthcare professionals who have certified in lifestyle medicine through the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. And they're, so it's a growing, it's a small but growing and passionate group of people who are trying to make changes. And, and we're seeing small changes. We're seeing University of Toronto have a two week lifestyle medicine um, uh, uh, part of their training in, in lifestyle medicine as in their medical student training. But again, it's too small. There are some places that have lifestyle medicine interest groups, but it's just a handful. So we definitely need to do better. And as we just saw from that study, our healthcare professionals are not leading by example in general and are not aware. I, I think they're not aware. And that's that really is the main reason I founded uh, Plant Based Canada with Michelle. Um, similarly to Shireen's organization in the UK, health professionals. Um, uh, plant-based health professionals uk to educate the public and the health professionals and policy makers in in this really you know it's, it's so important it's so important across the board mm -hmm. yeah and uh, i mean uh, we are i'm always hearing how uh gps like do general practitioners uh family doctors basically 
get something like a half day um, training on nutrition in their entire training? Is, is that over? Is that an over exaggeration? No, no. Yeah. And it hasn't. Yeah. It's not really changed much. Um, mm. As I said, there are pockets where it's changing, um, but not across the board, not systematically. Mm. Okay, well, I want to talk about um, plant-based Canada more in a second, but I, I want to get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty. I mean, I know you can't give us a full biology lesson, but um, what is it about plant-based eating in terms of prevention of cancer? Like, what can you give us a little like, you know, um, cancer, plant-based eating for cancer for dummies kind of <laughs> things are... <laughs> So I think we can we, we can think about, and I, I take this um, from the lifestyle medicine literature, we can think about disease development as having common pathophysiological mechanisms at the cellular and molecular level. So we can think about uh, microbiome changes. We can think about epigenetic changes, changes in the expression of our genes. We can talk about cellular injury and stress. And each of these mechanisms, they cause inflammation, and we know that inflammation is, is a key component of all our chronic diseases. This inflama inflammation then feeds back on these three mechanisms that I just mentioned, and you get this vicious cycle. And that manifestation in the body is our chronic diseases. So that is our diabetes, our heart disease, our, um, our cancer, et cetera. And if you look at these mechanisms, these can all be benefited by lifestyle interventions. So, and that includes our plant-based diet. And if we look at what is it in our plant-based diets that help, help that, it's all the antioxidants um, and all the other phytonutrients uh, that help prevent cellular injury. It's um, the anti-inflammatory aspect of having a plant-based diet. Uh, we may uh, have better hormone profile. So um, we have lower levels of insulin-like growth factor, which has been associated with increased cancer risk. We have lower risk of all those other chronic diseases that I mentioned, like diabetes. Um, and we can see in some of the studies that having comorbidities increases your risk of getting cancer. So that there's that piece as well. Plant-based diet impacts the microbiome in a beneficial way. So to get the best microbiome, uh, we want lots of plant foods, we want lots of fiber. And having that helps um, uh, our good bacteria, which is the fiber loving bacteria, or um, uh, they, they proliferate, we have more of them, we have more diversity, they give off, you know, various um, metabolites like short chain fatty acids, but then have all these anti inflammatory anti cancer effects, and they go all around the body. Um, and so, you know, plant based nutrition can affect all of these things, it can help us maintain a good body weight. We know uh, from the studies, if you look at for example, the Adventist Health Studies, the only group that was in the best, uh, you know, ideal body weight was the vegans. Um, and we know that unfortunately, being overweight increases your risk of 13 different types of cancers. So there are so many, there are so many mechanisms. We also avoid the carcinogens by having plant-based diets. So we avoid our processed meat and our red meat, which we know are carcinogens, according to the World Health uh, Organization. We avoid the heterocyclic amines, for example, when you cook meat, you, you produce these cancer-causing chemicals. Um, we avoid heme iron. Heme iron is pro-oxidant and damages DNA. Um, so this, there's just so many pieces of it that can be helpful. Wow. Yeah, it, there was, it really hit home um, a few years ago when, uh, I, I guess it was the World Health Organization, or correct me if I'm wrong, that declared certain meats as, as class one, or I'm not sure which class, but carcinogens. So um, yeah, Zara, tell us a little bit about that, a little bit more about that. So um, the, the class one carcinogen means, or the group one means that there is enough evidence to say with certainty that one thing is linked to another. So in this case, it's processed meat as a group one carcinogen uh, in the causation of bowel cancer. And we remember that this is one of the ones that is increasing in our younger population. And then the group 2A means a probable carcinogen. So that's what red meat is thought to be, a probable carcinogen in the causation of bowel cancer. And since then it's 
red meat and processed meat have been linked to various other cancers as well, including breast cancer, prostate cancer, uh, and I can list off a few more. And you know, it's not just cancer causation in terms of red meat and processed meat, but both of these have been shown to increase your risk of cardiovascular disease, increase your risk of diabetes, increase your risk of dying of these as well. So there's multiple uh, pieces to that. And um, more recently, uh, the group at Harvard showed that, you know, subsequent to them being declared carcinogens, and they showed that um, there was a particular type of DNA damage caused by red meat or associated with red meat and processed meat, DNA damage in the, in the colon, uh, that the more of these meats you ate, the more of that damage you saw, and the more of that alkylating DNA damage you saw, the higher the chance of dying of, of colorectal cancer as well. So uh, that's yeah. where we are with that. So we really, we should not be eating that. There is no place in a healthy diet for red meat or processed meat. And what about the other, you know, because I do know um, some people for their health that aren't eating processed meats and red meats. Um, does that mean it's it's a free pass health wise for for other uh, the eating of other types of animals? Right. Not at all. And if you um, again, if you look across the data, it's a plant based diet and minimizing your animal products that is better for for heart disease, for diabetes, for cancer as well. Um, if you there's just so much to say. I hope I can get it all out. So if you look at um, some of the prospective cohort studies, like the Adventist Health Study, the um, Epic Oxford Study, they have about a third of their population are vegans or vegetarians. So you can really study this uh, diet pattern and outcomes. And you see that if you if you uh, are a meat eater, your risk of cancer is here. If you become a lacto over vegetarian, it will go lower. And if you become a vegan, it will become even lower so you have this stepwise um way so if you look chicken eggs uh for example if you look at those in substitution analyses that have been done by harvard and the university of toronto for example none of those are going to be as good as plant proteins so your red meat if you're going to substitute that for plant protein you're going to get such a big benefit because um red meat processed meat increases your risk of mortality of dying if you if you substitute for chicken, you're gonna get a little bit of benefit, but you're still going to increase your risk of dying um, overall and from cardiovascular disease. And if you substitute for eggs and dairy in those substitution studies, you're still going to be increasing your risk of, of dying earlier compared to plant protein. So there's nothing that is going to match your plant protein. So, and, and there are other studies, for example, in breast cancer, uh, there was a big study it put together, um, all the studies yeah, for people who've been diagnosed with breast cancer and looked at their eating patterns and specifically looked at saturated fat. And saturated fat we know is, is code word for animal products because that's where we get, get it from. And the more saturated fat you ate, the higher the risk of dying from breast cancer. So no, it's not a free pass. Um, the other meats also increase your cholesterol levels and um which is a risk factor for heart disease so not a free pass at all mm -hmm. and um I, I, you know i i'm very curious about you know some of the uh, the myths out there uh, that you hear from folks around plant-based eating and health. You know, one of the things that just struck me when you said about you know, eating more meat increases, you know, especially saturated fat um, in which you find in dairy, eggs, and and uh, meats um, and fish, which I consider meats, <laughs> um, is that um, uh, that it increases your chance of cancer. Um, but on the other hand, you've got all of this uh, media about how soy is this terrible thing to eat around breast cancer, you know? <laughs> and so like, first of all, let's address that myth. And then can you talk about some of the other myths that are sort of getting in the way of people understanding what a difference the plant-based diet makes to their health in this way? So soy is the question that comes up all the time. I, I treat people with breast cancer, so I get this question every day. And I make a specific point to tell people about the benefits of minimally processed soy products. So we're not talking about soy burgers and all those uh, very heavily processed um, 
soy products we're talking about tofu and tempeh and soy milk and um edamame beans and soybeans there have been several studies in breast cancer specifically and they're all showing a benefit to specific, especially if you have a diagnosis of breast cancer having soy uh, minimally processed soy products whether you have hormone positive or hormone negative disease will reduce your risk of recurrence and dying of breast cancer and there is some evidence showing that uh, it, soy can reduce the risk of getting breast cancer, especially if you're eating that in your ad adolescence. Um, in 2019, there were these two massive reviews that came out on soy. They pulled all the human data together and they found that eating soy prevented quite a number of different types of cancer, or I should say eating soy was associated with a lower incidence of many different types of cancer, not just breast cancer, but including prostate cancer, bowel cancer. And then the uh, other um, big study showed that the more soy you ate, the lower your risk of dying from cancer. So I think we really, we really should put this myth to bed. <laughs> We really should. And you know what? And I, I, one of my favorite sort of things to ask folks in the medical field is what is the most succinct way to uh, disabuse somebody of the soy myth? I, I, like, for example, they t everybody says, oh, there's estrogen in, in, in soy. And I always say it's actually phytoestrogen. And, but you know where you find mammalian estrogen is in meat and dairy, <laughs> you know? So yeah. So what, what is there a particular way that you like a one liner or two liner that you'd give in cases like this around the cancer scare? Um, I, you know, I say the evidence is very clear. Uh, this is what the evidence is saying. And I can tell you that I eat soy every day. I feed it to my children. I have no, no issue with having it. So I think, you know, also saying that personal aspect of it, that you also do it is helpful. Absolutely. Um, Tenebrae said, may we have the reference to the meta-analysis on the relationship between soy and breast cancer? You know what? I've got a whole plant-based data. Uh, Canada has uh, amazing meta-analysis of every soy study that's ever been done. Um, I'm going to share that in the group, Tenebrae, so you can check that out. Um, all right. So we've been talking a, a lot about prevention, Zara. Um, what about for those with a diagnosis of cancer? I mean, can it help? I know it's, you know, there's a lot of people who sort of grasp at whatever when they're in this place of crisis. Um, but is it too late by that point? That, that's a great question. And I get that a lot from uh, the people I see that, oh, it's too late. But um, so many people ask me about that. So, and I love talking about that. So that's why I run late in my clinic all the time, but it's absolutely, uh, I can say that we can impact how we do after a cancer diagnosis, not only by what we eat, but also the other lifestyle measures. But, you know, in terms of what we eat, there's definitely data showing that there's a lower risk of dying from cancer. Um, I'll give you one, one example from a study I, I just love. It's from the uh, Harvard group. Um, they looked at over 170,000 participants, they followed them for over three decades, and they looked at what people were eating and other lifestyle measures as well. And they score people according to their alternate healthy eating index, which favors, it, it's basically a, a scale that gives you better marks for plants, and you know, it gives you lower marks for things like red meat and processed meat and trans fat and, and salt and sugary beverages. That's the other thing that we mustn't be having. And they showed that if you had you know, the best diet according to this alternate healthy eating index, you could reduce your incidence of dying from cancer by 30%. Um, and if you had all the other lifestyle measures as well, not smoking, not drinking alcohol in excess, doing some physical activity, being a good body weight, you could reduce your risk of dying from cancer by about 60%. And that same study showed that you could reduce your risk of dying from cardiovascular disease by 80%. Um, so definitely there's, there's benefit. We have a massive randomized control study looking at nearly 50,000, around 50,000 postmenopausal women showing that those who ate more fruit, vegetables, whole grain and lower fat had a lower risk of dying from breast cancer. We have data in colorectal cancer. Uh, you know, and these are in our big cancer journals that what you eat before and after a diagnosis of colorectal cancer, the more plant foods you eat, the less animal foods you eat, 
the better your survival outcomes. We see that in prostate cancer as well. So there's, there's definitely lots of evidence that you can impact how you do afterwards. It's in our cancer guidelines as well, that you know all the guidelines for prevention um, that we can run through as well. They say, if you have a diagnosis of cancer, you do these uh, things as well. So uh, lo lots, of, lots of great data there. The other really exciting thing that's coming out recently is um, for, um, for people who are on treatments like the immunotherapies, uh, that having more plants in the diet seems to uh, be associated with an improved response to your treatment. So a big study came out this year, well, not, not a big one, but a, a study came out this year, it was in one of our highest impact journals, looking at immunotherapy and the Mediterranean diet. And we know that the Mediterranean diet, and, and especially in this study as well, prioritizes fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and minimizes uh, their meats and red meats and, and processed meat. And they showed that the more you adhere to the principles of a Mediterranean diet, the higher your response. So there's so many pieces to that, but that's really exciting. And one of the thoughts is that this is driven by the microbiome, by having more, more plant foods, you can have a better microbiome, more short chain fatty acids that we've discussed already, and that that can help improve your response to treatment. Sarah, there are actually um, there are a few few fairly good documentaries out there um, uh, about sort of the effects of plant based eating on uh, chronic diseases. Are are there any that you recommend people check out? Um, I love forks over knives. Yeah, um, so good. Yeah, game changers, mm -hmm. and this is especially speaks to my male patients who yes. who uh, find that compelling and. Um, I also love Code Blue by Saray Stansek, Dr. Saray Stansek, Stansek, who is a who's the director of research at uh, Physicians Committee of Responsible Medicine, and she um, she had has a diagnosis of MS, and she uh, managed to put her symptoms into remission. She had very bad disease, very symptomatic, and by lifestyle. Um, put that into remission. So, so Code Blue is a wonderful documentary to look at as well. And she's also written a book, What's Missing from Medicine, which is a lovely book. Mm, fabulous, Sarah. Um, okay, so folks, um, I am, we will probably, uh, we'll try to make time for a few questions. Um, so if you have a question for Zara, you can put uh, uh, star, star, star Q, and then the question. I did notice there were a couple of questions early on, and I did take note of them. So if you've asked a question already, don't worry about it. I got it. Um, uh, but first, before we do go to that, Zara, you know, four years ago, you co-founded this excellent organization called Plant-Based Canada, um, and you gave us just a little, little taste of, of why. Um, but can you, I mean, this is something that you're putting your very precious time into. Uh, why do you think this organization, like what is it about this organization that really called to you um, and you felt it was important to do? So I was uh, really inspired by my sister Shireen and this. Shireen is a hematologist in the UK and in 2017, she founded uh, Plant-Based Health Professionals UK and uh, for, for educating um, health professionals and the public on the evidence-based benefits of plant-based nutrition. And in 2018, she had her first conference, which it was the first plant-based nutrition conference ever in the UK. And I flew over for that. And I was just really inspired by all the evidence, by the enthusiasm, by the energy in the room. And I I said to Shireen, would she help me organize a similar conference in the in Canada as a as a test run about you know what the interest was there and and so we we did that we had our first conference in July 2019 before we actually founded Plant Based Canada and it was sold out we had so much interest in it so that's when you know inspired by Shireen um, Michelle and I who had been talking about this um, you know how we could educate and contribute as well we decided to form Plant Based Canada. Um, uh, similar to showing not just for individual health but for planetary health and we were very lucky we are very lucky to have a wonderful team of volunteers around us who who help us and of course none of this would be possible without without them and we have uh, a podcast plant-based canada podcast and we in, in addition to educating we want to highlight the canadians who are already doing this work so um stephanie and clint are our podcast hosts and I think they do a fabulous job. We've had over 60 episodes. We're currently listened to in 68 countries, which just blew my mind. Wow. Um, uh, but it really, you know, it, it, we really want to showcase the Canadians doing this work. And I think we, we, you can really see that there's lots of amazing stuff going on. 
Mm. And so, you know, just really addressing what we were speaking about earlier that, uh, I mean, we can make all the noise we want, but if people are still going to their most trusted doctors and those doctors are saying, you know, you need more meat in your diet, <laughs> whatever, you know, uh, all yeah. that sort of thing, or, uh, oh, you're vegan. Oh, I don't know. That's, that's worrisome. Yeah. Um, so it, that, that's sort of one of your main, um, focuses is, is other healthcare professionals, Zara. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you know, when, you know, just going back to the myths that you were talking about, those myths are also with in health professionals that you, just as you said, you need meat to survive. Where are you going to get your protein? Um, you need dairy. Uh, you can't bring up your children <laughs> as vegans. Right. And, uh, right. So, you know, I, we do webinars. Uh, we're happy to be invited anywhere to spread the word. Uh, we do our yearly conferences and we use the podcast as well. Um, and Perfect. hopefully, yeah. And, um, and uh, Kirsten, uh, do, uh, can we find a, we have a link for Plant-Based Canada here, but also the podcast link, if you don't mind. Kirsten's always very quick at <laughs> finding these. I'm sorry, sure she was already looking for it. Um, okay, so uh, one of the questions I, I want to ask you about is, is, is I love Plant-Based Canada's official mission, which is to educate the public and health professionals on the evidence-based benefits of plant-based whole food nutrition for individual and planetary health. So tell us more about why this part of it, the planetary health, it was so important for you to put into the mission. Without planetary health, there is no individual health. And I think as health professionals, you know, as global citizens, we all have, we all should be um, helping out with this aspect, but for health professionals, especially, and, you know, David Katz, who is a past president of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine says, you cannot rightly call yourself a health professional if, if you don't frequently and fervently advocate for the health of the planet. And if we, you know, we're, we're in a terrible situation and we know that food, our food system is a central driver, not only in our climate crisis, but our ecological crisis, as well as our health crisis. So if we look at the downstream effects of planetary health, we are going to have global warming, we're going to have increased air pollution, we're going to have disruptions of our systems. And in terms of uh, health, we're going to see increased cancer risk, increase. Uh, so for example, with skin cancers, GI cancers, lung cancers, we're going to see increased cardiovascular disease, increased heat related deaths. We're going to see disruptions of our food systems, we're going to be able to access fruit, fruit and vegetables less, that's going to increase our incidence of cancer. And we're totally disrupting going to disrupt our health systems. We can already see that. We already have data on that for, for those people who've been affected by hurricanes and floods that you, you can't get in to see your doctors. The power grid is out. You can't receive your radiation, your treatment's interruption, interrupted. So we're seeing already, we're seeing negative health outcomes and we're destroying our planet. We're, this, our food system is the leading cause of biodiversity loss and species extinction. We've lost 60% of our wildlife in the last uh, 50 years. It's the leading cause of deforestation and ocean acidification and pollution of our water and our, our land. So um, we have to address the food system in this. And we know that in discussions on climate change and sustainability, food is often ignored. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, our, our hope is to be able to start those conversations in the places that that matter and um and just make just amplify those voices so uh, and in the healthcare system we know that five percent of all greenhouse gases are produced by the healthcare system and there are organizations looking at this but i think the food aspect is not loud enough yet mm -hmm. um, so Zara, we're, I want to move into some questions because there's some really good ones. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, folks, we, if Zara, if you're willing to stay just a few extra minutes after one, um, that would be wonderful. And of course, everybody, folks I know can drop off whenever you need to. Um, I'm not going to mark you on whether you have to, you stay till the end or whatever. Um, but we've got such a brilliant brain here. So we want to use it. Um, so Zara, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk, ask you a few questions. Um, 
uh, different types of questions. Um, first of all, um, someone is asking, my husband was born with Lynch syndrome. He's vegan and a non-smoker and has never had cancer thanks to lifestyle. My understanding is that cancer genes and other genes need to be activated to bring about, about disease. Is it true that we can turn cancer genes off by diet and keep them off? Can you also talk briefly about scleroderma and how diet can improve or reverse it? Okay, so first, first off, talking about um, whether it's true that we can turn cancer genes off by diet and keep them off. So when we look at um, cancer genes, we, we can see that five to 10% of all our cancers are caused by the genes that we are born with. Um, absolutely, that is not your destiny if you have a mutation that increases your risk of, of cancer. And there are many and more and more are coming up uh, as being associated with cancer development. We can see in twin studies that you can have twins with exactly the same identical DNA, but they don't always, both of them will not get cancer. So what is it that's helping turn off and on the genes? And that is your lifestyle. Now we can also do as much as we can with our lifestyle Nothing is 100%, but you can absolutely make a big difference. And we can see that with our diet and lifestyle, we can impact and cause these epigenetic changes. So these, this is the change in the expression of your genes. So absolutely, um, you can help by what you're doing already, by not smoking, by having your plant-based diet, from being physically active, keeping an ideal body weight, and not drinking alcohol, as well, you know, that's really important, especially, you know, in Lynch syndrome where colorectal cancer is part of that uh, syndrome. Uh, and I, I just do want to mention the, the alcohol guidelines here actually, because the Canadians just put out their Canada alcohol guidelines. From a cancer perspective, it's very clear from the guidelines, they say it is best not to drink. To minimize your risk of cancer, it's best not to drink. The Canada guidelines say that maximum if you want to drink one or two a week beyond that you're increasing your risk of seven different types of cancers um, and uh, increasing your risk of cardiovascular disease heart disease and stroke as well um, so you know well done for doing all those things you're absolutely right you are going to be making a difference to yourself don't forget the stress management good sleep social connections these are all really important as well your genes are not your destiny absolutely and um, and one of the things that, you know, you mentioned at that I think it's really important for for us who are advocating to people around um, the health benefits of uh, plant based eating is that um, there are still people that they can do everything and they're still going to get it. And I think there, we have to really watch with the victim blaming um, when it comes to diagnosis um, of, of chronic diseases. Um, so Zara, how do you balance that with, you know, making sure that, be, that people have the resources they need um, when they're diagnosed? I'm so glad you brought up that point. It's such an important point. Um, I see that in my patients as well, that they blame themselves, that, um, what did I do wrong? I must have done something wrong. And um, it's absolutely not that. We can do the best we can. It's estimated that 40 to 50% of cancers are preventable through lifestyle measures. Um, the rest is, is other things that we don't always understand, but we live in a very toxic world. Um, our air, the water we drink, the pesticides, et cetera, et cetera. So absolutely, it's not all about what we can do, but we do our best to minimize uh, our risk. As Dr. Kim Williams says, I don't mind dying, I just don't want it to be my fault. Um, but yeah, so absolutely, there's a lot of it that's not in, in our hands. And what was the second part of your question, Kimberly? Um, so yeah, so how do we balance that with, with giving, you know, somebody that maybe has a, a diagnosis, you know, being able to give them some, some help in that, that mm -hmm. department um, without that feeling of, of victim blaming? Yeah, and that's absolutely right. So I, I always say to my patients, none of this is your fault. Nobody can tell you why you have got cancer. Nobody can pinpoint this. But um, so none of this is your fault, but we can definitely try and help and um, make things better by what we do from now on. So I, I really focus on what we do from now on. And it's absolutely, there's never, never should be a blame game. Mm -hmm. 
great, thank you. Um, and this, the last part to that question um, that we got a little off, I took a little off track was, um, uh, is there a link uh, between, sorry, I just lost it. Um, talk briefly about scleroderma and how diet can improve or reverse it. Yeah, there, there is some emerging literature in the um, inflammatory arthritis conditions of benefit for plant-based nutrition. Scleroderma is very uncommon, and I don't know um, if there's been any specific uh, research in scleroderma itself. Um, it's a very unique condition, but I would say that in principle, the anti-inflammatory diet uh, that the plant-based diet brings, the all those beneficial phytonutrients must have a benefit. We know for, uh, in some literature, there is, um, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, that having a plant-based diet can reduce the experience of pain from your joints. Um, scleroderma affects many other parts of your body as well. And having a plant-based diet can also, you know, as we said, it reduces the risk of other chronic diseases. All of us are at risk of chronic other chronic diseases. So you, you don't want to compound um, the consequences of scleroderma by having other uh, chronic diseases that could affect your kidneys, for example, where scleroderma can affect the kidneys and other aspects of other organs as well. So being tip top in those other aspects is gonna help your scleroderma. We know that the experience of pain is less in other inflammatory disorders as well. So it has to be helpful. Great. Um, Zara, also um, we keep on sort of dropping in whole food uh, plant-based. And I, I think it's important to make that differentiation. Um, so yeah, tell it's, 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 you can't just have a vegan diet and assume your tip top shape. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I know that's absolutely right. I'm glad you brought that up as well. And there are studies now looking specifically at that. So when we look at the plant-based diet and the plant-based indices of what you're eating, there's now the healthy plant-based diet indices and the un index and the unhealthy plant-based diet and if you are eating unhealthily with lots of processed food you are not going to get those benefits that even when you compare yourself to an omnivore you may be increasing your risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes and other chronic diseases by having even though it's vegan by having the unhealthy plant-based diet um, so you know, the, the statistics in Canada are terrible, you know, over 50% of uh, what we buy is ultra processed foods. There was a shocking study from the US looking at adolescents saying that 80% of what adolescents ate were the ultra processed foods. Um, so absolutely, it is whole food, plant based. So it's foods that we recognize, foods that are minimally processed, uh, and not the things that you can't recognize uh, not our pastries it's not our packaged foods it's not our our ritz biscuits or our oreos or our french fries or our donuts mm -hmm. it has to be lots of fresh fruits and vegetables lots of whole grains beans lentils and other legumes nuts and seeds uh, this is what your diet should be made of and that, and and that doesn't mean it has to be raw it doesn't mean like you know zara was saying that soy milk for example is still considered a whole food. And, okay. and so the difference is it's just, it's minimally, it's minimally processed, right? Absolutely. So we have to separate so much of our food is, has to be processed in some way. Mm -hmm. So it's that minimally processed versus the ultra processed. Yeah. 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 And I'm just, to me, it's kind of like the, some of the processed vegan, the really heavily processed vegan food. To me, it's like having a glass of wine once in a while. I know it's not necessarily good for me, but you know, it brings me some pleasure and we have to have some pleasure in life, you know? So um, it's, it's, you make your choices about where you're going <laughs> to roll the dice a little bit more, but, but to really in that regard, consider those things, a treat a once in a while, as opposed to a daily thing. Exactly. Um, okay, another question, and this is going to something more activisty. So um, I, I love this. Stacy says, "How can we get hospitals to feed patients appropriately, and healthcare systems to educate the public accurately? Are there any healthcare professional or uh, associations in Canada that are working towards this as an organized group?" That's, it's a really difficult thing to change, uh, and I'm, you know, starting to understand a bit better 
how purchasing happens in a hospital through group purchasing organizations. People get discounts for certain foods, you know, the hospitals get discounts for certain foods. Different hospitals have different arrangements. So it's it's not a very easy fix. There's a Nourish, that's an organization in Canada that is looking to bring in a more plant forward diets into the hospitals. So they have um, an initiative this year, in fact, that they're, they just launched in June. They want to get 100 hospitals to adopt their planetary uh, hospital plate. Um, we have Greener by Default, who um, we all know from the amazing work that they're doing with Mayor Eric Adams in the New York Health and Hospital Systems, having uh, all their food there being plant-based by default. Um, so they're working with some uh, places in, in Canada as well. So for example, uh, in Vancouver, the Vancouver Coastal Health is working by, with Green by Default to bring in plant-based meals. So, um, you know, I, I love their philosophy of having things by default. One of the things you come across uh, the barrier is that you're taking away people's choice if you're going to make it plant-based and, and greener by default get around that by just making it the default but you are allowed to choose the meat-based option but it's by default and by doing it that way you know 60% of people had the plant-based meals if you calculated their savings in terms of greenhouse gases you save greenhouse gases you save cost as well in New York but um, the Canadian system is, is slightly different but uh, I would contact if you greener by default for example um and nourish if you want to know more about that uh, we have the uh, canadian coalition for greener healthcare that's been around for about 20 years and um they do they have i've just been revamping their their food page actually uh to put more of the recent evidence in so you know they they are promoting plant-based diet as well but it's just actually operationalizing that I'm not seeing plant-based eating in any of our conferences or our hospital food or our educational things, but th things are starting. So, you know, in my, in my uh, you know, National Organization for Radiation Oncologists, we've just had a uh, commission to form a sustainability and planetary health committee. And, you know, I'm on that and I'm hoping to promote the food aspect of that. So it's starting, but it's not, it's not good enough. It's not good enough yet. Yeah. So for all of, uh, for the folks here, you know, who are, are uh, activists um, and are, are really sort of charged up in this arena, um, you know, take a look at all those organizations that Zara mentioned uh, and check out and see if they need an initiative in the town or city you're in um, or how you might be able to help. So um, this is definitely a place where we need a lot more people power. Um, uh, on the tail of that, Ken is asking, are there, uh, are any organizations or individuals lobbying the government for cancer warnings on processed meat? I don't know yeah. if you would know this, Sarah, but yeah, it's an interesting question. Yes. I don't know anybody who's doing it, but absolutely we should, uh, just, mm -hmm. um, but just to give you an, an example. So, um, I went to, uh, my GI oncology conference I go to every year this year and they were serving red meat and processed meat. Right. Wow. Yeah. Okay. GI cancers. <laughs> That's <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, yeah. So again, an another very interesting activism direction. Um, uh, I, I don't know if Ken's willing to take that on. Ken, I think that would be amazing for you. <laughs> <laughs> the asker of the question gets to claim it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really, uh, that would be a really good campaign. Uh, okay, uh, Jason is asking, what would you recommend for someone with significant, and please, I don't know if I'm getting this right, FODMAP sensitivity issues? Mm -hmm. They severely limit uh, whole, uh, whole food plant-based options. Did I get that right? Is, or should have I said F-O-D-M-A-P? <laughs> no, FODMAP. Perfect. Okay. So, okay. Um, I'm not an expert in that, but I would really strongly suggest you find a dietitian who is an expert in GI disorders. It's a, it's a complicated topic and there's lots of things that can um, uh, increase your symptoms from the plant-based world of, of, of that. And the FODMAP diet is there to reduce your symptoms related to, to those GI upsets. Um, but you know, there, there's wonderful plant-based um, dietitians that you can ask for support. We have a great directory uh, on Plant-Based Canada website and 
there's a there's a dietitian Desiree Nielsen in BC who, who specializes in GI disorders. I'd advise you to check her out, but there's lot there's others on that list as well. Mm, excellent. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not answering that very well. I'm not an expert. No, it's a great place to start. Thank you so much, Sarah. We don't, I mean, you're a smarty pants, but you're not expected <laughs> to know everything in the world. <laughs> Um, okay, a couple of more questions, if you don't mind. Uh, the Bev, Beverly is asking, is there a link between diet and uh, tall cell papillary uh, thyroid cancer? Is it hereditary? Um, so thyroid cancer is one of the ones actually on the list of ones that are increasing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we've looked at that particularly specifically uh, at that particular type. Um, but the same principles would apply in my mind that you, you should still, uh, stick to the principles of a whole food plant-based diet for all those reasons we talked about right at the beginning about what can increase cancer risk uh, or what the mechanisms are at play. So I haven't seen any data specifically in that, uh, cancer site, but definitely whole food plant-based. Mm. Thank you, Zara. Um, Kathy is wondering how fish figures into things because you were doing the, you know, red meat, the chicken and everything. Where does, where does fish, because fish is still considered a health food for a lot of folks. That's right. So if you look at the fish literature, um, in general, overall, it shows benefit. And um, that may be because of the long chain, you know, omega, omega-3 fatty acids. So whether that's about the fish or whether it's about the long chain fatty acids. I don't know. Um, now, of course, we have to think about the pollution in fish because none of our fish is unpolluted anymore. And if you think about aquaculture, now it's even, even worse with all the antibiotics and the anti-pesticides and the anti-corrosives that have to go into that. Um, so in general, the fish data has been positive for health but you absolutely don't need to eat fish. We can see that from the studies that look at vegans and vegetarians, that they have the best, uh, the lowest rates of all those chronic diseases we talked about. Uh, give you one example, the UK Biobank looked at omnivores, pescatarians, and vegans and vegetarians, and there was an additional benefit in terms of reducing cancer risk if you went from pescatarian to vegan. Um, so, I, I personally don't think it's about the fish that makes it healthy. You know, you have to, whenever you're looking at studies, you have to look at what else are you eating it with? What are you eating it instead of? If you're eating a Mediterranean diet and most of your diet is from plant foods and you've got a little bit of fish, when they look at studies um, about the Mediterranean diet, for example, the PREDIMED study, when they did a, a post hoc analysis, it wasn't the animal products that or the fish that was giving the benefit. It was all those plants that were giving the benefit. So, um, you know, you're, you're not going to find a lot of data on fish saying it's very detrimental, but I think there's better choices to make. And um, it's all about interpretation as well. Mm, thank you. Um, Zara, somebody is asking about, you know, processed meat and beyond burgers and, and, you know, just sort of the idea is like, could a beyond burger be worse health-wise than say a, um, a beef burger? No, I don't think it is. I think it's going to be much better. And we have some data behind that. So, you know, the downside is that the this is processed. It has a lot of salt in it, has a lot of um, fat in, and, it, and it's processed, as I said. But when uh, this study uh, was done, the meat swap study, that was the one that was funded by uh, Beyond Meat. And they showed, of course, it's better for the environment. Your environmental footprint is great. But even your, you know, when they looked at your biochemical parameters, um, and things like TMAO from your microbiome, um, that it was better. So it is going to, I, in my mind, it is better than having a red meat burger. And this study did look at Beyond Meat compared to red meat, but the best quality red meat, so gra according to them, um, grass-fed uh, beef. So there, there are benefits, I think, and, uh, both for individual and planetary health. But again, there's going to be better choices to make. Got it. 
Okay. So yes. So we're still allowed to have some beyond burgers once in a while. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Excellent. Okay. Well, Zara, thank you. You have, um, you have answered a lot of questions. I'm so sorry if we didn't get to your questions, um, but I can't possibly make our guest stay longer. Um, But last question, Zara, is what can uh, uh, AJAers do to help uh, plant-based Canada? Is there anything that we can do to assist? Thank you for asking that question. You can listen to our podcast. You can come to our conferences. Um, that would be the best thing. Yeah. And if you if they get on uh, the Plant Based Canada email list, they'll get notices of the conferences. We always share about the conference Thank conferences you. in AJA as well. But that way, you'll for sure get them if you're on on the uh, on the mailing list. So. Absolutely. Okay, well, Zara, thank you so much for your wisdom and your kindness and just your sort of all around awesomeness. Um, You know, even though we talked health, we touched on some other incredibly important pieces. um, And I love that coming from a radiation oncologist that you're thinking in such a global way. It's it's very heartening to see. Um, And knowing that you're on the inside is is you know, gives me some hope. (laughs) Not that it's all on your shoulders, darling, but Thank you for your kind words. I am, as I said, I'm so in awe of everything you're doing. Thank you very much for inviting me. Mm. And thank you to the Kassam family for just basically changing the world. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, AJAers, um, you're wonderful for showing up here, for learning as always, and for being open to um, uh, helping change the world. Thank you so much. And we'll see you at our next event. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be sending out uh, the event details soon. Bye, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much for coming.